this series is called Freedom's Fighters, and we honour people who fought the good fight for free markets, free enterprise and individual liberty. It started in nine, uh, 2019, and now we're doing a new series post-COVID, post-lockdowns, and we're very honoured to have tonight Nadim Zahawi. He has been, wait for it, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Children and Families, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Business and Industry, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for COVID-19 Vaccine Deployment, and that was one of your finest hours, uh, Minister for Equalities, Minister for Intergovernmental Relations, Secretary of State for Education, Chancellor of the Exchequer, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Minister Without Portfolio, and Chairman of the Conservative Party. But more recently, the position that caps them all in January this year, he was appointed patron of the Adam Smith Institute. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those of you acquainted with history will know that there was at one time a super talented cabinet that was called the Ministry of All the Talents. We've done better tonight. We've got the talent of all the ministries. <laughs> so now I will start the questioning, if I may. Um, Nadim, your family fled Iraq when you were 11 years old. And you came, Saddam Hussein was coming to power at the time. Um, what was it like to leave your own country and start all over again in a new one? Frightening. Yes. Um, deeply upsetting in many ways, because by the time you reach 11, I've actually got an 11 year old now, my daughter, and you sort of begin to form um, your sort of friendships, uh, relationships at school um, and your community. And therefore, this 11 year old was sort of asking, you know, why is this happening to me? Um, coming to a, a new country um, with very little English. Uh, in the early days, uh, where um, education was really tough. Um, I, uh, my parents enrolled me in, in the local comprehensive um, in uh, uh, West London. How quickly did you learn the language? Took about eight to 12 months. Oh, okay. I used to sit at the back of the class, I used to hide at the back of the class because children can be unbelievably cruel. <laughs> um, but uh, when I sort of started to pick up a few words, I try and string words together in my head because I didn't like making mistakes and being laughed at. Uh, but by the time I've made the sentence in my head, the subject matter had moved on in the classroom. Uh, and so the early days of my uh, time in education, my teachers thought I was learning uh, difficulties. So they called my parents in. But of course, once I'd picked up the language and started to uh, read and write and think and dream in the language, you discover very quickly that this is the greatest country on earth. Uh, yes, thank you for that. <laughs> Your background is uh, Kurdish. Indeed. Uh, uh, indeed, when you were working with Geoffrey Archer, mm -hmm. It is rumoured that he nicknamed you Lemon Curd. We start with a K, of course. Um, have you ever revisited your Kurdish roots? I have, very oh, much so. Gone back, yeah. Yes, many times, many, many times. And uh, the, the, the Kurds have uh, been a, a beacon of, of uh, early uh, democracy in, in uh, uh, that part of Iraq, certainly. And um, it is you know, uh, imperfect, but uh, they... Uh, once, if you recall, uh, under John Major, um, after Gulf War I, uh, the Kurds were protected with the no-fly zone. Uh, they initially had a, you know, a short civil war, as you do, um, and then decided actually they're much better off getting together and forming a parliament and a government and having elections and uh, beginning to think about delivery for their people. And so uh, it is early days, but nevertheless, it is a real beacon of hope in the region, uh, which clearly at the moment is going through some very dark times. As are many places. Mm. Yeah. You were born in 1967. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in Britain and America, this was dubbed the summer of peace and love and flower power. Yeah. Have you ever from outside, assuming you were not part when you were being a small baby, uh, have you ever from outside sometimes admired any aspects of the hippie culture? Um, <laughs> you can't but admire hippies. I wish I had the hair uh, to go with it. But uh, uh, I guess in many ways, um, obviously, uh, by the time uh, I had moved to the United Kingdom, it was 1978, 79. Um, uh, and of course, uh, in contrast to life uh, in Iraq with the 
Ba'athist regime, um, which was truly terrible, uh, in many ways a, a paranoid place, um, the, the, the level of mind control, you know, the, 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 the Stasi had basically trained the, the Ba'athists as to uh, how to sort of create that sense of fear and suspicion, even at school. Do you mean literally um, the, the East Germans? No, totally, uh, 100%. Huh? Um, uh, you know, we were always reminded in the morning at school uh, not to talk about, you know, what we discussed at the breakfast table because your teachers would ask you um, in the morning and they'd, they'd sort of go around the classroom uh, and some children may be naive to say, oh, well, my father said this about the regime and you know where that ended up uh, for that particular parent. Um, and so, of course, uh, in many ways, uh, you know, I guess if you ask me what I admired about the 60s and 70s uh, here in the UK, it would be uh, the, the unparalleled freedoms. Yeah. Um, if I think about the gift that this country has given me and my family, it is freedom and opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I guess that is why I'm sitting here as a patron of this incredible um, think tank. Yeah, yeah. Now, you've been something of a serial entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, which of your various ventures did you find the most satisfying? <laughs> Don't say all of them. No. Uh, well, I'm going to say two things. One, um, failure is important. Uh, and of course, um, we, I do sometimes worry that in our country, there is a culture uh, that is um, frowns upon, looks down at failure. Uh, whereas I in the US, for example, where I had my sort of greatest success when I took YouGov to America, Failure is celebrated. You know, people invest in people who may have been you know, may have failed once, twice, three times, uh, whereas here uh, it is sometimes a, a deterrent to investment in, in individuals. Uh, and so um, failure is important, and I learned from my failures. I had a, you know, a, 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 a particular company that I um, began, and I thought I was going to succeed in because um, uh, we were getting the sales. I hadn't kept my eye on the bottom line, uh, and therefore the cost base was too high. Uh, and it doesn't matter what your sales are. If, you, if you're not making money, and of course cash flow, um, then you will fail ultimately. Uh, but the most satisfying has to be uh, YouGov with Stephen Shakespeare and my incredible team that um, uh, you know, turned it into a, one of the UK's unicorns. Okay. Um, have you always supported free markets and conservative principles? Or was there a moment in your life, you know, the, the, um, the light on the road, I mean, a book, an event, a person? What was there a moment when you relatively quickly be realized you were free market, libertarian? Or has it always been that way? Accidental would be the way I would uh, describe it, but probably instinctive. I, I've never supported, uh, I've never been on that sort of journey that many young people go on from, uh, you know, seeing the attractions of, of socialism and then realizing very quickly that it doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I had zero interest in politics uh, because to me, uh, growing up in Iraq, uh, p politics was really uh, what got you in jail uh, because it's a one party state and if you disagreed with the socialist, nationalist, Ba'athist party, um, there was nowhere for you to go. My, um, uh, I guess, political awakening happened by accident because I, on the first uh, day at University uh, College London, uh, where I read chemical engineering, um, where you have obviously the Freshers' Fair, mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, on my way to the University of London Union, ULU, for those who've been uh, to London University, uh, as it's referred to. And there was a, a, a and by the way, I was a very, very thin um, uh, young man in those days, nowhere near the bulk that I am today, very skinny with, with sort of big teeth. Um, but um, this man who was handing out the Socialist Workers' Party magazine uh, at the uh, entrance to the uh, union building, uh, I, all I did was politely decline his magazine. Uh, and he decided that that, that gesture was uh, something that would upset him uh, and therefore became very aggressive uh, and just, you know, he really was about to beat me up, uh, which uh, uh, really bothered me. Uh, and I thought, you know, the best way to get back at him was to go and find out what the other side thinks. Uh -huh. uh, uh, and so uh, I went to a, um, a little trestle table 
uh, which uh, had the Conservative Collegiate Forum, uh, and I very quickly signed up. So I'd be correct to say that you joined the Conservatives because of the Socialist Workers' Party. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what would you say is, is the most attractive feature about free market economics and individual liberty to you? Um, I guess for me it is the extraordinary way that it can change lives, transforms lives. Um, if I look at my own um, experience and uh, my um, I guess hard work, but also uh, uh, incredible good fortune. Um, it is transformational. Uh, if you work hard and uh, the um, society from within you come from uh, allows for those freedoms to flourish, um, we can make incredible things happen. Uh, and you see it uh, now in those states in America that are very much uh, um, you know, driven by political leaders who believe in free market economics and the way they're, they're doing so well, and in the states who are going in the opposite direction. Now, the beauty of America, of course, is that competition between states creates an incredibly dynamic economy, which is why I, I always say never bet against the American economy. Um, uh, and I just think that that's a great lesson um, uh, to learn, that, that actually free markets are an enabler of great things to happen at scale for society. And they don't put you into boxes. Correct. Do they? Yeah. Absolutely right. Now then, uh, you've been MP for Stratford-on-Avon. Yes. Since you're not the most famous person ever to come from Stratford-on-Avon. <laughs> I've got the goatee though. Yeah. Are, are, you a, are you a Shakespeare fan yourself? And if so, what's your favourite play? Um, quite a dark play uh, uh, in uh, Macbeth. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, you're supposed to say the Scottish. Uh, I know, I know. We're not in Parliament, but that's fine. Um, uh, and I, I was able to, in my um, interview for Stratford on Avon, recite Act One, Scene One, with the three witches. When okay. shall we three meet again? In oh. thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly burly's done, when the battle is lost and won, ere shall be the set of sun. You're on air now. You might get sued for copyright. Ah. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, you. When you founded YouGov, mm. which you said was you know, the, the one you enjoyed most, yes. um, had you any idea that it would be so successful? I mean, were there any fun moments or were there any scary moments in those early days? No idea. Uh, and I went back to uh, UCL um, after I took the company public uh, at the invitation of the vice chancellor then. Um, uh, and I was asked to give a lecture to what, they had an enterprise group um, that was between University College London and Stanford and to talk about my experience. I opened my lecture by saying, if you are thinking about starting a business because uh, you want to make money, you'll very likely fail. There is no correlation between your desire to become wealthy um, and success in business. But if you uh, start a company because you want to do something brilliantly, if you look at whether it's Zuckerberg, Gates, uh, jobs, they didn't start businesses because they want to make money. They want to make the best operating system, uh, the best piece of hardware, mm. the best social network. Uh, and if you obsess about that, the byproduct will be financial success. Um, and we had no idea in the early days. Uh, the reason we, be, we started YouGov, actually, um, uh, much of it was because the early days of the internet, uh, Stephen Shakespeare and I met through and you mentioned him earlier, Geoffrey Archer was looking to run for mayor of London. He, and he gathered a group of young conservatives, um, all of us aspiring to be members of parliament. Around that table was Sajid Javid, Priti Patel, um, and, and many others. Uh, and of course, when his campaign collapsed, um, I enjoyed working with Stefan so closely that I thought we could do something together. And the idea of YouGov was essentially um, that the world was be becoming networked. I mean, many of you in this room are digital natives. I can tell you, you know, I grew up in a world where, uh, as Madsen did, there was a, a sort of fax machine, and uh, uh, you know, well before mobile telephony. I'm, I'm pre-fax uh, machine. I, 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 I think you, you keep so well, Madsen, that, that uh, I doubt that very much. Um, anyway, um, the point being was that the, networked, the network effect uh, will shift the equilibrium um, from the executive 
whether that be government or corporates, to we the people. You know, no taxation without representation. Boston Tea Party. Uh, and the idea behind YouGov was that we were going to, it was initially called LondonGov.com because we were going to do it for the then uh, would-be mayor of London, i.e. we launch a website. Uh, this was, by the way, the, the times of dial-up connection on, on um, uh, uh, sort of, you know, exactly right, um, AOL uh, uh, and others. Um, and then the mayor would ask Londoners as to how they want their money spent as well as pay their taxes online. These were the, the days where, you know, this was, 99, 2000, nobody paid anything online in those days. Uh, no one did a survey online. Um, uh, and the reason we wanted to do it was actually exactly that, that sort of shift in the equilibrium. And the reason I called it YouGov, it was an amalgam of two words, you and govern, i.e. Um, it's, it's citizen um, consumer democracy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, we had no idea how we, to make money, uh, but we knew we, we were onto something here. Um, uh, when people started to engage. We became the news uh, delivery platform for something called FreeServe. If you remember FreeServe, uh, one of the early portals, as they, they were called. Um, and uh, one night at midnight, I got a phone call from the chief executive of FreeServe to say, what's happened to your servers? Um, and literally, I went online, and the news which we delivered had frozen completely. So I called uh, in a panic our one techie that we had um, and said, look, what's going on? He said, oh, we've put up a survey about fuel costs and it's crashed the servers. People are voting on this thing in such numbers, it's crashed the servers. Uh, of course, we fixed it and the next morning I was able to apologize and move on. Three months later, there were people blockading the motorways, if you recall. Oh, I remember, yes. Um, uh, because of the pain they were feeling because of the cost of fuel. And that's when the light bulb went off in my head that we were onto something here yeah, because yeah. we saw it three months earlier yeah. in the reaction to the survey we'd put up. Um, and um, I guess the rest is history. You once said, I don't hide my failures. Um, are there any mistakes you've made that you've learned from? Of course, absolutely. Um, and of course, I guess not quite the, 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 the elephant in the room uh, would be clearly the, 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 the events of last January. Um, where uh, obviously I was uh, released from my position as, as chairman of our great party, uh, the Conservative Party. Um, I you know, disagreed with the findings of uh, uh, the report, but I do absolutely believe that it's right that politicians and our political leaders are held to a higher standard um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, a higher account um, than anyone else. Uh, it's a far cry from the system I, I grew up with in, in Iraq, where uh, we had to pretend uh, or turn a blind eye uh, to any uh, mistakes or misdemeanors or failings of our politicians, uh, because they were always right and always brilliant, um, as you have now, sadly, in many countries around the world with dictatorships. Um, and I have to say, as someone who is in love with data, uh, mistakes are very much at the heart of the empirical system. Um, you know, Trial and error oh, of is how we improve. Yeah. Uh, and um, I think it's right to you know, reflect and think, well, maybe I could have done better. I should have been much more explicit in the way I filled in my ministerial uh, declaration. Um, uh, but more on that in my book, which will okay. come out next year. <laughs> show me a man who's never made a mistake, and I'll show you a man who's never learned anything. That's a famous quote, and I think it applies to everyone. So. We normally ask a few quickies about your personal taste. Yes. Come on. Beer or wine? Which? Wine. You like wine. What yeah. type? Red. Ah, there you go. <laughs> What's your favourite snack? Oh, my goodness. Um, Crisps? No. Peanuts? No, uh, cashew nuts. Salted cashew nuts. Salted cashew nuts. Yeah. Hey, we're on agreement. <laughs> um, <laughs> what would your ideal holiday look like? Oh, my goodness. I am a creature of habit. Uh, as those who know me well, I like to go to the same places. Um, over and over again. Uh, my wife sometimes say, it, it, you know, you're the, probably the easiest politician to assassinate uh, because you go to exactly the same places. Um, predictable. Uh, uh, very predictable. And so I enjoy going back to places I love and um, I know well and restaurants I enjoy because ultimately uh, a holiday is to be able to switch off and think of nothing else other than what food you're going to eat and uh, is the family having a good time. At risk of assassination, we need some names of places. Oh, my goodness. Um, I, I love um, the south of France. I love Tuscany. Um, 
anywhere else. Oh. Um, US is always wonderful. Dubai in the winter, uh, it does what it says on the tin. If, you know, if yeah. it's, it's a great place for, for when you've got two sort of grown up kids and an 11 year old. What, what's your favorite sport? I, I, I'm told you do riding and show jumping. Is that right? Are you show jumper. Really? Yes. Yeah. Did you yeah. ever win a prize? I did many, yeah. many rosettes, but my greatest claim to fame, I think I, I rode many, many centuries ago, Hicks of the Young Riders and got eliminated in the first round, but nevertheless, <laughs> I still made it. Um, my favorite sport is football, soccer, as in watching, what, 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 watching, <laughs> watching rather than playing. Um, you, you played a key role in the COVID-19 uh, vaccination rollout. Mm. What's that your most satisfying job? It's challenging and most satisfying, absolutely. Yeah. In the sense that um, I took on the role with one condition. I, I never forget when I got the phone call from the Prime Minister, Boris Rank, to say, um, I need you to do this uh, 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 for your country. Um, and you know, the country was hurting. Um, I was in the uh, business department then, mm. dealing with many, many businesses you know, from construction to manufacturing who were really in, in, in serious uh, pain. Um, and so when he uh, offered me the opportunity uh, to make a real difference, I, I jumped at it. Uh, and scale is hard. You know, I always say this to young people who are looking to start a business uh, or in government. You know, scaling anything is difficult. One of the challenges inside government is we launch so many pilots, yet we never really deliver scale um, that makes a real difference uh, to people's lives, or rarely do. Um, and actually, one of the great things that we did in that um, delivery, um, in that operation, was um, you know, smash the glass ceiling and say, we're, we're, we're going to go for it. And our record was just shy of a million doses a day. I used to say to my team, you know, please don't tell me how many vaccines we've ordered or how many we've got in the warehouse. Mm. I just wonder how many we've put in people's arms and, and saved their lives. Exactly. Um, uh, and, and that is a, a, a I have to say, um, building teams is important. Uh, you, you know, when you're attempting to do something that big, you can't be a micromanager. You've got to build a great team uh, and then back them and make sure you, you sort of you know, smash through any bottlenecks that there are, the, the caveat I, I, I asked Boris to um, uh, agree to was I said, I'll only take the job if I can speak with your authority because I knew I had, you know, I didn't have the luxury of, you know, days or weeks to wait for a decision. I had to make decisions in minutes and, in, and hours. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't have his authority and his support, I think we would have probably um, not done as well. Um, and actually, t t t you know, to his credit, he gave me that, 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 he empowered me to be able to do the job. And we, uh, were, well, we were first in, in the world, weren't we? we well, were, with we Israel, were, I think. We were we're much, we, yeah, co equal with Israel, I yeah. think. Yeah. Obviously, you know, much larger population, therefore the scale uh, uh, was, was impressive. And I would just end with this. I do think um, it is in this D nation's DNA that when we are challenged at times, of you know serious uh, challenge, whether it was this vaccine program, or I was privileged to to be Chancellor of Duchy of Lancaster when her late Majesty sadly passed, uh, and to put on that funeral in 12 days, uh, the equivalent of organising, by the way, the Olympics in in 12 days, the largest gathering at short notice of world leaders, uh, 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 monarchs, prime ministers, presidents uh, uh, at short notice. Um, when we are challenged as a nation. We do set our differences aside and come together and smash that target. The names of Churchill and Thatcher spring to mind. Indeed. In Indeed. that very context. Indeed. Uh, but um, what do you th why do you think so many young people are drawn to socialism? And how, what's the best way to combat this? Well, I, th I think sometimes you, you forget that actually young people are inher inherently capitalist, in my view. Uh, they want um, uh, freedoms. They want lower taxes. They want to buy their own home. They want to be innovators, they want to be wealth creators, um, uh, they want to take risks. And I think actually um, we should think about how we reward that behavior. Uh, if we uh, stifle those desires, uh, then you begin to think of dependency on government. You know, one of the things I always feared during the uh, pandemic um, uh, and it was right that we had to make sure we had a really strong safety net 
for those who uh, you know, were, were in financial difficulty. Um, but my fear was always that you had to get the balance right because otherwise you get into a sort of culture where the, you know, the government can fix every problem mm. um, because um, that's what governments do. Uh, and I think that there is, a, there is a, a, a balance to strike. I'd much rather live in a country uh, which I believe our country is. Our country is not socialist, and, and thank goodness for that. Not the same culture, certainly, in, in the countries I've worked across Europe, where, where you know, the, the, that, that DNA is very different to ours. I think our DNA is very much, you know, we're a nation, as, as uh, you, know, you mentioned the great lady, of, of shopkeepers, of, of traders. Mm -hmm. uh, and the more we can, as policymakers, think about how we reward that behavior, um, the greater the outcome. Uh, it may not happen, but there is the prospect of a Starmer-led government. Mm. Does it fill you with dread? I mean, how, how, how do you feel about it? <laughs> I worry because um, I think Keir, uh, many will see him as this extraordinary Machiavellian politician who literally didn't believe a word that Jeremy Corbyn had said, but just went along so that he can knife him and take over as leader. I don't believe that's true. You know, you look at whether it's Chukaramuna or others who decided actually to leave the Labour Party altogether because they couldn't subscribe to uh, that hardline sort of socialist mm. view. I think Keir believes in this stuff. He's just doing the opposite now. He's sort of masking it uh, because he's so close, he thinks, mm. to winning an election. Um, uh, and I worry that when he is prime minister, what we will see is, 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 the, is the much harder left Keir. I hope you are wrong. But final question now. Um, do you think that support for free market economics and personal liberty are intertwined? Yeah, totally. Does the one necessarily require the other? They're completely. Uh, I think people know what's best for them, for what's best to do. Uh, uh, to make sure that they uh, are able to uh, do well for themselves and their, for their families, for their communities, uh, with their own money and their own lives. Um, <coughs> it, it is absolutely um, uh, ingrained. It is human nature. Um, uh, so much of what uh, supports a free market, of course, uh, is to do with um, liberal values, individual freedom. The rule of law, um, democratic participation, mm -hmm. uh, private property ownership, uh, you know, free markets um, are about cooperation. You, you, it is absolutely inherent to success that you cooperate to produce um, positive outcomes. Um, and of course, um, you look at what Margaret did with widening ownership. I remember mm. um, in my early days as a councillor in Wandsworth with the great Eddie Lister, um, you know, walking around some of our estates and just seeing the transformation, the moment people were able to buy their own and, flat. And you could tell which ones had been bought. Tell, immediately, <laughs> the, the, the yep. door is painted. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's, <laughs> there's, there's nice planters outside. Uh, everything began to look different. Because they were the protecting price. their own property. Absolutely mm. right. So it only remains for me to give you a small present. Now, when we gave him the Adam Smith bus, yes. it appears on his he appeared on his desk the next morning. Indeed. We'll be watching television tomorrow when you appear. Here's an Adam Smith tie. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.